Well, looking back on your first 100 days as governor, what would you say your proudest achievement is and your biggest mistake? <laughs> I think I, I like the energy of the administration. I, I like the vigor and the, the commitment to detailed nuance. I think it was reflected in that first budget. Uh, I know we, it was a two-hour uh, presentation, but I, I hope it gives people a sense of um, the, the seriousness to which we take the job, the willingness to, to get under the hood. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the first 100 days have been shaped by two things. Uh, one is California is the most un-Trump state. And uh, the fact that we're now in 47, 48 lawsuits with the Trump administration, it's not what we chose, but we've stood tall uh, and we pushed back against Trump and Trumpism, uh, protecting our health care framework, protecting uh, our diversity and, and advancing a different narrative around immigration. Our budget uh, is very much in contrast uh, to an administration that's uh, running close to trillion dollar deficits. We'll be paying down all of our debt. Um, and I think that obviously has marked disproportionate amount of time and energy uh, as it relates to the work we've done. And, and biggest mistake or regret? I don't know about regret. I think the knock is you can try to do a lot and sometimes you do too much and that gets in the way of people having some clarity in terms of what you want to accomplish. That said, I spent two plus years on the campaign trail saying I was going to vigorously address the issue of housing and homelessness and uh, address the issues of preschool and education, uh, environmental stewardship. Uh, and, uh, and I think we've at least made down payments on all those things. And had I not done that, I think the critique would have been, well, wait, you came in and promised all of these things and uh, now you've abandoned them to do just one or two things. So uh, I don't know if that's a mistake, but I sort of reflect on that as sometimes things getting lost uh, in the message that sometimes things uh, take shape that uh, you know, get a lot of attention, other things that are worthy of, I think, public uh, attention uh, often are overlooked. And from a communications perspective, perhaps that's a, that's a significant reflection. You've made a lot of big announcements in your first 100 days, high-speed rail and delta tunnels at the state of the state, National Guard withdrawing uh, most, not all, of the troops from the border, the death penalty moratorium, although there hasn't been an execution since uh, 2006. In, in each of those cases, uh, maybe some others, there are some caveats or nuances to each that, that your critics might say, uh, well, the governor's actions don't match the majesty of his words. And, and how would you respond to that? I, I can't, because I don't, I, I'd have to listen to the details. Um, the moratorium is what it is, and uh, I, I stand by it. Uh, as it relates to trying to get the high-speed rail back on track, I stand by that, and you're going to see a business plan that reflects that in the next few weeks that we put out. Uh, we worked an enormous amount of, well, a lot of energy uh, we put into that. Um, I'm calling the question on a lot of issues that, frankly, were out there that people danced around. Quietly you heard, but no one wanted to come to grips with them publicly. Um, so I, you know, I feel pretty good about uh, all of that. Uh, recognizing that these are tough issues and uh, you know it's sometimes easier just to let things go and not be held to account but uh, I feel like we want to be more transparent I think more accountable at the end of the day more honest uh, about what we can and can't achieve uh, I, I, I like the, the energy around homelessness and housing it's created some you know people challenging some of the approaches but that's healthy uh, the fact that we're suing cities, the fact that we're trying to link transportation dollars, those are good debates, they're healthy debates. The issues around um, transparency in charter schools, healthy uh, debates. The issues around wildfires and the issue of, uh, of addressing fire suppression as at the same time you address the utility uh, question moving into a climate uh, change debate. I think those are overdue healthy conversations that add a little bit more nuance and specificity. Uh, but again, they, they invite uh, 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 pushback. They invite analysis. And uh, I think that's, if there's any point I'm trying to make, is that we're not unwilling uh, to lean in to some of these vaccine issues. Sure. You brought up wildfire li liability. So just to follow up on that, because on Friday your strike team released a report on wildfires, prevention, and especially liability. Who should pay for damages that uh, utilities in particular uh, cause or utility equipment cause, uh, but maybe that utilities weren't necessarily at fault for. And right now you've got PG&E in bankruptcy protection. You've got Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric uh, getting lower credit ratings. There are concerns that rates for ele electricity and gas will go up. Your report lays out three specific concepts for covering wildfire damages. Th that's just your report saying here are three ideas. What do you, 
California Governor Gavin Newsom think should be done? I want to get something done and I want to build consensus. Um, now my, I've been at this a while and I think the biggest mistake sometimes people can make in this position is ready, fire, aim, as opposed to ready, aim, fire. My point being, um, no pun intended on the wildfire issues, is we got to build consensus. I think there was an effort and it's not an indictment, it's a reflection of the past. There was an effort, the previous administration, to throw out what the governor wanted to do, didn't get a hearing. Or if it did, it didn't get very far in the legislative process. You're talking about inverse condemnation, the uh, trick of moving the, not the trick, which would change strict liability, liability laws in yeah. California. My, my point is, reflecting on that as a recent example uh, and reflecting on the compromise, which was 901. Uh, the we, legislation passed by the legislation year. passed by legislature being inadequate to this moment. I don't want, I, I want to make sure what we do really works. And the only way to get something done that really works is we've got to do it together. And so I want to create the conditions to invite um, an appropriate deliberation between the legislature and myself and, and use the bridge that is this 901 commission that was established by the previous leg, uh, legislature and the previous governor that I think is a healthy um, uh, adjudicator of some of these uh, ideas and they will make some more substantive recommendations based on my report and based upon some of the legislative work. Uh, meanwhile, we are massaging those conversations. We are organizing in a very deliberative way with a lot of uh, interested parties in the state uh, to address where we think we can go uh, and where we would have a more difficult time. My point being, I want to get something done and I want to get it done within 90 days. Uh, the July 12th uh, is the deadline and I think if we are successful, it will be because of that process. Uh, if we're not successful, it's because we were trying to uh, do too much too soon, too fast. This is complicated and it requires a gestation period with a lot of groups and interested parties that need to digest the consequences of change because one thing is not working and that's the status quo. We all will pay the price of the status quo and it is jaw dropping those costs. And so I'm trying to address that, I think in a, in a different approach and different strategy and different way. You don't just have to bring lawmakers along, you have to bring voters along because the idea of a quote unquote PG&E bailout, and I recognize that you can affix the term bailout to anything you don't like and make it a, a talking point, but voters don't want that and they yeah, can turn sour on you awfully quickly and yeah. yet you're you're certainly saying we at least at the very least need to consider this deeply unpopular step yeah no i'm i'm not bailing out pg and &E. i've never argued for that in fact a report calls and and uh, uh, break the glass scenario municipalization. I don't know how that could be construed as a bailout, but uh, no, I get that. And, and the purpose of this document was to make public the complexities of this. It's a climate change report. It's a report about, uh, forgive me, procurement. Uh, it's about sustainable energy policy. It's a, a report about governance. Uh, it's not a report about PG&E. Uh, it's a report about utilities operating uh, with the hots getting hotter and the dries getting drier. Uh, it's a report uh, about the backdrop of, uh, of community choice aggregators and direct access power purchase agreements. I, I forgive the vernacular, it's a complicated uh, nuance, a deep dive uh, in the nature of electricity uh, in the modern era. And it's a report that is long overdue, uh, despite the fact that it was precipitated uh, situationally by a PG&E bankruptcy, but it by no means limited to the question or issue of PG&E. It's a much deeper and broader question. Has PG&E lost the, the, basically a monopoly in, in large parts of the state? I don't know about that. I think they've, they've lost trust, public trust. They've lost trust with this administration. I was very pointed. I sent a letter but 10 days ago uh, attaching very strong opinions about uh, their new board of directors, uh, the one uh, that was rumored and ultimately the one that came out. I, sure, I've been I pointed about my expectations in terms of behavior. I said they misdirected and they've, they've been, they mistreated the public. I said that at the press conference. So uh, we've been very pointed and, and to the extent that uh, they are committed to changing their ways, we'll wait and see, but uh, they don't have much time to prove that. And meanwhile, we're moving aggressively to influence the, the bankruptcy proceedings uh, and moreover broaden uh, and influence as it relates to the larger issues of governing in this environment outside of PG&E's territory, including in Southern California and substantively in the southern part of the state, San Diego. Uh, moving over to immigration now, you've obviously seen the president float the idea of sending migrants seeking asylum to, to sanctuary cities. And 
California is, of course, a, a sanctuary state, and I think folks in your party feel very proudly that they are so. So why not embrace this proposal and, and welcome them all in? Well, that's what they're doing. They've been dumping people on the streets and sidewalks in San Diego, a sanctuary city. In many ways, the policy is unwritten. Uh, that's what they're doing. They're sending folks to uh, street corners and Greyhound bus stations in a sanctuary state, disproportionately in our state, uh, legal asylum seekers. That's why we opened a migrant facility to do the job of the federal government to provide some humanity and some dignity through that process and to make sure people don't end up homeless or uh, in our emergency rooms. Um, look, this is pure political theater. Uh, that's all this is. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, California is a universal state. It's a state of refuge. We've taken in more refugees than probably any other state in America. We're a state with 27% of us foreign born. We'll do our fair share and, uh, and we'll continue to defend and embrace uh, sanctuary policies that come out of uh, the Civil War in El Salvador and Nicaragua, state of refuge, cities of refuge, uh, church-based movement that was, I think, enlightened, uh, that ultimately is involved into sanctuary policy that exists for one reason, the failure of the federal government on comprehensive immigration reform. You want to end sanctuary policy? Uh, advance comprehensive immigration reform. In the absence of it, even Rudy Giuliani, when he was mayor of New York, embraced enthusiastically sanctuary policy because it's nothing more than community policing and building a framework of trust. Uh, and in turn, I think it's wise policy despite the political potency around these issues. Even some Democrats nationally are, are saying, yes, you know, we accept there is an emergency at the border, the, the crossings are up and all that. Do, do you accept that there is a, a state of emergency at the border? Uh, it's, it's manufactured by the Trump administration intentionally. I was just in El Salvador. He's intentionally making things worse by pulling all the federal funding in the Northern Triangle for El Salvador and uh, other countries in Central America. That's going to increase the migrant crisis. His unwillingness to address the issue of due process and support the adjudication of claims at the border, his unwillingness to staff and fund those efforts exacerbates the issue. Uh, and in many ways, he's inviting a crisis of his own making. He's manufacturing it uh, for purely political purposes to feed the base. Uh, most folks, common sense uh, begs uh, this as an objective fact. Uh, most folks, I think, acknowledge that. Uh, some will deny it, of course, uh, but the fact is he's ginning this up uh, very intentionally because this is the debate he wants to have. He doesn't want to have a bait, debate about trillion dollar deficits. I have a question for you from PolitiFact California, which is part of Capital Public Radio, and it's about your campaign promise to appoint a state homelessness secretary to oversee an interagency council on homelessness. <laughs> and you haven't yet, 100 days in. Uh, and Do for that it matter, tomorrow. what's that? Are you? I did it tomorrow. Is it really? Just All right. Laughing. Tomorrow's news today. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, but you also haven't appointed a director of the Department of Housing and Community Development or, or even the cabinet level agency that oversees that department. Yeah. Why the delay? I think you'll have one on that in what, an hour or something? Uh, the, the other? Um, yeah, there's a. I think we have 3,600 appointments, and um, I think we've made, um, I think we've done justice. You know, I have an administration, 70% of the horseshoe are women, uh, very diverse. Um, we've appointed uh, liaisons on early education, higher education, child care, work groups, strike teams on a myriad of issues. I'm very proud of that. Uh, we put out a detailed plan on homelessness in the budget. Uh, I don't know many governors in their January budget that were that specific. You'll see even more in the May revise. Um, we've been working um, to uh, put together an advisory team uh, on an issue I care deeply about and have been deeply involved with for decades. Uh, we'll be making subsequent announcements in Riverside tomorrow uh, about some of our next iterations and plans on homelessness. Um, and uh, on the issue of transportation and housing, uh, I don't know any other administration that's been more aggressive. Uh, just ask the folks in Huntington Beach and look at our budget and tax credits. and. Uh, some strategies we have on linking transportation. Um, we've got aggressive strategy on the DMV. Uh, we're working uh, uh, to uh, put out, in fact, I hope to put it out this week. Uh, we're going to, I think, do justice to what the voters uh, wanted under SB1 and uh, the legislature wanted in terms of transparency and efficiencies at Caltran. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, more information about those efficiencies that go much further than the legislation called for. Uh, and uh, we're putting together, I think, a world-class team with one or two positions uh, left, including mental health. Uh, and the person I want has some vetting issues based upon conflicts because he owns some stock that uh, he's got to sell before uh, he can come work for us in a way that doesn't create ethical issues. 
As we wrap up our time, just a couple of questions about the, the budget and, and revenues for the state. Uh, you've called for a 911 fee to modernize the state system from, as you say, analog to digital, a clean drinking water fee for poor communities with dirty water, and you've said you want the state individual health insurance mandate and penalty to replace the federal one. A lot of regular Californians, regardless of what a court would say, a lot of regular Californians would call those tax increases. Can, can Californians afford this? Yeah, I don't think we can afford not to modernize our emergency communications. Uh, the fact that uh, for seniors, people with mobility impairment, the lack of access to geospatial, uh, GPS technology, the ability for our first responders to uh, get uh, location mapping done because of our uh, old analog system uh, is an embarrassment, uh, candidly. And by the way, there's been efforts in the past, none of this is novel. Uh, there were efforts in previous administrations to do exactly this. They fell short. Uh, we're trying to get it done. Um, on the issue of safe drinking water, you have close to a million people that don't have it. There's Flint, Michigan's all across California. Uh, that's unacceptable. I don't think we can afford to live a good life in an unjust society, as Aristotle said. And there's no injustice, or no justice rather, when uh, people can't bathe, let alone drink water, and they're still paying for that water more than they are in Beverly Hills. And uh, I think uh, there's been efforts in the past that I picked up on, uh, not new again, uh, that I want to see if we can get across the finish line. So on both those issues, I, I feel uh, like previous administration was on the right track. I want to see if I can help uh, accomplish those things. Um, and ultimately on the, the broader issue of uh, uh, individual mandate, Trump administration has vandalized the Affordable Care Act. I think the Affordable Care Act is overwhelmingly supported by Californians. I, I want to put it back together. I think that's an appropriate response. And to the extent that people need subsidies, that what's so significant about uh, the individual mandate, the third leg of the stool, is that we're able to deepen subsidies into the middle class, uh, expand them rather into the middle class and deepen them for people of low income means. So there's a direct correlation there to affordability and access. But I can assure you this, without the mandate, healthcare premiums for everybody begin to go up. And I don't think we can afford that. Why not do some of the new revenue increases out of the general fund? You projected a $21 billion surplus in January. Well, we need to pay down pension obligations. We need to pay off uh, all of our debt. I want to pay off 100% of our debt. I want to begin to dress, aggressively pay off pension obligations, where there's a huge return on that investment. Uh, a historic rainy day reserve, because I want to make sure we're ready uh, for an economic downturn. Uh, I want to be wise and thoughtful about one-time surpluses being used for one-time investments, and there's a distinction there. Um, we put together, I think, a very thoughtful budget that was fairly well received by all sides of the political aisle. I was pleased that more conservative-minded people thought there were aspects that uh, made sense. More progressively-minded people liked the investments in preschool and keeping uh, the cost of education, higher education, flat by investments in higher education and child care programs, obviously health care, expanding uh, not just the opportunities uh, as it relates to the ACA, uh, but reimbursement rates uh, for more early childhood screenings uh, and the like. So uh, I think you'll see that reflected in the May revise and that same kind of discipline, but same kind of progressive framework of investment. Uh, I think the budget um, is well uh, equipped to address, but I think if you start adding all these other things, these ongoing expenses, using one-time money, you're going to end up back to where we were. And with all due respect, I'm not willing to go back uh, to the bad old days of budgeting. Uh, I like what Governor Brown did in the new approach to budgeting. We want to build on that. What about a soda tax statewide? Uh, that's, I'm, I'm, I haven't even got my arms around that. It's not on my immediate agenda. And, and finally, are you preparing a more cautious budget for your May revise uh, because we've seen some of the revenue numbers start to Yeah, slip? I am. Uh, there's some good things that have happened since January. There's some cautionary uh, issues. I'll be with uh, Governor Cuomo later in this week talking about the issues of state and local tax deductions, SALT. Uh, he has pointed to that as having uh, already had an impact uh, in New York. One could uh, assert that in California, though I still think it's too early to tell. Uh, our revenue is trailing, but again, still too early to tell. We tend to do better late, uh, so we'll know in a few weeks. Uh, we're collecting, as I sit here with you, uh, $1 million in revenue every minute. Uh, this so is this is a dynamic moment in California's uh, tax history. As we wrap up, do you want to point out anything you're, you like about your office? Oh, well, well, my favorite thing, if there were a fire here, if there were a wildfire that made its way to the Capitol, I'd 
grab that photo of my father and, uh, and Bobby Kennedy. That was the night uh, Kennedy was killed, and, and my father used that, um, well, intended to use that unknowingly as a campaign uh, uh, ad for his efforts to run for state senate against Milton Marks. No one, including Bobby Kennedy himself, probably could have beaten Milton Marks. Um, but that is another part of California history, but that's a special photo because Bobby is my hero. Uh, his hard-headed pragmatism, his sense of idealism, um, he, uh, he, he captured the spirit that, uh, that uh, is always, I've always felt connected to. Are these artworks, pieces of art, your choice, or were they here? Yeah, most the uh, from, uh, from my city hall days, a lot from the Young Museum, all connected to California's history in some way, shape, or form. And so uh, California coast, uh, obviously some early uh, transportation vernacular, shipping back in the day, and obviously out there and uh, right off the coast uh, of uh, Seal Beach area in San Francisco, Ocean Beach. And what's back there? You, you finished unpacking yet? I've uh, just literally, literally about 400 boxes back there. How about 30 boxes? It looks like 400 boxes. So no, we're still unpacking. Still literally, this, most of this furniture from my house. Uh, but that's Earl Warren's desk. Uh, when he was governor, people forget uh, Governor Earl Warren, not Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren. So they found that in the archives. That's a, that's a special desk. And we had some chairs in here that we just, I don't know where we pulled them out from uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, so it's a wonderful history. I mean, from Pat Brown, Jerry Brown, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger himself, it's a humbling place to be, uh, governor of California. It's a challenging place to be in this moment, being governor of the most untrump state in America uh, at a time uh, when you have a presidential election coming sooner uh, than some think, and uh, Speaker Pelosi in your backyard, and uh, an ascendant candidate, and Kamala Harris, and oversight committee chair, and Adam Schiff. Uh, California's front and center in the national de debate and discourse. And I think one of the points I'm, I'm very proud of is California's holding its own. And uh, we're substituting, uh, I think, for leadership at a time when we have a president who's abdicated leadership. He's going in a completely different direction in the state. And to the extent we can keep the ACA together, uh, we could continue to protect and, and promote our credible diversity. If we can do more on budgeting to sort of send a message that there is a way to be progressive without being profligate, uh, I think all the better for California. Well, congratulations on your 100 days. Governor Gavin Newsom, thanks for talking with thanks us. Thanks for having me.